Okay. You are presenting it from the yeah. Dr. Ajit Tiwari to present the paper on results and outcomes of treatment of chronic allergy <coughs> pregnant dislocations. Respected child persons and audience, uh, very good morning to all of you. Myself, Dr. Ajit, uh, going to present my uh, work, my uh, study over the results and outcome of the treatment of the chronic underdose perilunate dislocations. Uh, as you know, that uh, carpal injuries are the very uh, relatively uncommon. It's a 10% of all carpal injuries. The perilunate dislocations are only the 10% of the carpal injuries. And they're often, un unfortunately, they're often uncognized and uh, inadequately treated. High energy trauma to the wrist causing severe disruption to the corpus and it definitely it's a formidable challenge to the treating physicians. As all of you know very well that the corpus was tightly linked by a combination of the capsular and torsius ligament. The lunate is the keystone of the corpus and acts as intercalated segments. The proximal is attached to the distal row and the capsular ligaments that cause the mid corpus space and both sides of the lunar capitate articulations. As the uh, pathomechanics is that Mayfield, uh, as he has described, uh, he has classified in the four stages. The stage one is that when the patient has the hyperextension injury to the wrist and there is a tightening of the scapular uh, STD ligaments that causes the extension of the scaphoid and that leads to the force of the lunate bone and that causes the disruption of the both dorsal and palmar ligament, scapular and ligaments. The other is that uh, glulas arc, if, if a patient has a perilunate dislocation, there will be the loss of the uh, glulas arc. And the dorsal perilunate, dorsal perilunate injury, if, the, if it is a lesser arc injury, so definitely it's a pure ligament injury. On left, let's say you can see that there is a line axis of the capitate dorsal to the lunate and proximal to the scaphoid rotated dorsally. In anterior posterior view, you can see that there is a uh, lunate will look like as a triangular, and obviously the glulas arcs will be disrupted. In case of, you can also see that the still tick up sign. The treatment is closed reduction and cast closed reduction and pinning. And uh, if it is not possible, then you can go for the open reduction internal fixation with the ligament repair. If the patient has a greater uh, arc injury, it means that the fracture of the scaphoid, capitate, and tracheotrum also. The acute treatment is as same as in the less arc injuries, but if the patient has presented late, so you can attempt for the open reduction, internal fixation, proximal door apectomy, and total resfusion. So this study, the aim and objective of our study is that uh, late treatment, primary risk of the disease, excision of the lunate, PRC, uh, open reduction internal fixation in selected cases of less than six weeks of injuries are given regardless of the time of delay. In literature, uh, the problem is that the small number of the patients only and the follow-up assessment is often limited. The purpose of this study was to assess the results of our treatment of chronic perilunate dislocation and provide some comments upon their management. Uh, but, uh, this study was conducted in two th uh, June 2008 or uh, uh, from 2008 to 2009. Uh, its uh, duration was one year. We have studied on uh, eight patients. All patients were the male. Six patients had transesophageal trilunate dislocations. One patient had transadial uh, trans uh, transadial steroid and transesophageal perilunate dis dislocations, and one had pure ligamentous injuries. Untreated for minimum of the six weeks of injuries, and all the patients were treated by the single surgeons. Uh, this was a chart you can see that the, what protocol we have followed that the open reduction open reduction and internal fixation only by the dorsal approach with the ligament reconstruction and repair of the irrespective of the duration since uh, surgery. The surgical techniques uh, we have taken the dorsal incisions in between the third and fourth extensor compartment and followed by the uh, the capsule uh, the dorsal capsule of the wrist joint has been reflected, the flap is reflected. Followed by, uh, you can see that the joint is open and the lunate is completely dislocated. Uh, then we have passed two K bars. You can see that the one K bar in the scaphoid and another K bar in the lunate. So we that uh, we have uh, used as a joystick to reduce the dislocations of the lunate. So you can see in this picture that uh, we have used as a joystick and the uh, lunate is uh, relocated. We have uh, put one uh, anchor suture in the lunate so that we can uh, uh, we can tighten the dorsal capsule and dorsal uh, scaphoid ligament, reconstruct the ligament. And the results of this study was that uh, you can see that the arc of movement is uh, tremendously improved uh, two times and the repetition is also improved in 30.8 years. The pain is uh, most of the patient. Uh, it, uh, uh, approximately 80% of the patient are completely pain free and uh, you can see that the male risk score is the 29.5 from 29.5 it raised to the 78 and it is a significant difference. 
this is a case uh, this is a case of the fracture of viscoid along with that fracture of viscoid along with the preliminary dislocation it was completely neglected and the patient was had a patient was treated by the orthopedic surgeon it was a packed cast and the patient has came to us after seven week and we have uh, it was uh, told to the patient that the patient has a fracture of the distal radius and uh, they have completely missed that the patient has a perineal dislocation along with the fracture of the scaphoid so now we have uh, treated the patient by uh, putting the bone graft and a hobart screw and uh, we have repaired the dorsal uh, scapulonate ligament and after the surgery the patient uh, you can see that the range of movement is completely normal near normal so, uh, the second case is that you can see that uh, it is a uh, old perineal dislocations without any scaphoid fractures patient came first and we have treated you can see yeah you can see that the uh, range of movement is not very good but the uh, functional patient is better than the the operatively so this question is the uh, perineal dislocation and associated injuries may be easily overlooked or misdiagnosed the clinical prognosis for delayed diagnosis and the treatment is poor compared with injuries that are treated acutely the upper time limit at which an uh, initial unrecognized perineal dislocations may be reduced with an acceptable result is unknown and the different treatment method is uh, in literature that open reduction internal fixation proximal locatectomy limited and total wrist fusions there is no consensus and small series chalk meter for the problem of this type of the uh, this type of the perineal dislocation the natural history of untreated injury is unknown uh, you can see that there are paper uh, uh, there is a publication from the mayo clinic the long term follow up of the undiagnosed transesophageal perineal dislocations demonstrating the articular remodeling and functional adaptation the meaning of uh, to this is that the, the patient has a chronic perineal dislocation so we uh, we can go for that uh, we can go for the, uh, uh, we can go for the uh, treatment proper because at follow up you you can see that the post traumatic articular remodeling was seen in the this the radiograph and the patient had only a mild functional deficit so the conclusion is that although the late open reduction can be accomplished up to one year of injury in our series the end result in case treated more than two months after the injury was not as satisfactory as in those treated within a two month of the injuries thank you so much for attention good afternoon any questions from audience Have you used any devices following the routine? Uh, no, sir. Actually, uh, we are opening the dorsal side and we are repairing the dorsal scapulonate ligament by using the suture anchors. So, if you are using the suture anchors, and so that I don't think that uh, repairment of any cable to pass from the scapula to the lunate, because the uh, that repair is as uh, very strong. So there is no need to put the cable. How long they were removed? Ah, uh, they were removed. I think for uh, uh, the average period is that the six to eight week. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can I call up on next speaker? Speaker, please remember the presentation time is only five minutes and two minutes for discussion. Please take your time. Cover the study of surgical management of middle third clavicle fractures. Senior surgeons and delegates here. I am Dr. Abhishek, postgraduate in JJM Medical College, Davangiri. Uh, I would like to uh, present my paper with the title "Comparative Study of Forearm Fractures Treated with Locking Compression Plate versus Limited Contact and Compression Plates." Coming to the introduction, forearm bone fractures are commonly encountered in today's industrial era. The encouraging results that have been reported with recent advances in internal fixation techniques and instrumentation have led to an expansion of surgical indications for such fractures and implant of choice. Open reduction and internal fixation of plating is generally accepted as the best method of treatment for displaced diaphyseal fractures of forearm. The limited contact dynamic compression plate was set to reduce the bone plate contact by approximately 50% to minimize the disruption of periosteal plate vessels beneath the plate. It still relied on the plate bone interface for stability and the problem of confluent contact areas was not completely resolved. Locking compression plate was devised by combining the features of limited contact dynamic compression plate and point contact fixer which is called specific. Theoretically, this allows for more rapid bone healing and besides decreasing infection, bone disruption, delayed union or non-union and secondary loss reduction. But reports on results of clinical application of LCD are few, especially on its efficacy or superiority or other traits in the treatment of diaphyseal fractures of forearm. And uh, coming to the objectives, the study has been carried out to compare the functional outcome of fracture fixation in diaphyseal forearm fractures by using locking compression plates and uh, limited contact dynamic compression plates. And to study the difference in duration of union and complications with LCPs and LCDCPs. 
the methodology found a twelve-fold is the prospective randomized comparative study, which was carried out from uh, June 2011 to 2013 in our institution in group. Uh, the study was made in two groups. Uh, in group one, 20 patients were subjected to open heart fixation with 3.5 mm stainless steel LCDs and locking hair and non-locking screws. Then in group two, 20 patients managed with 3.5 mm LCD CP and non-locking screws. The clinical assessment regarding pain and function radiological assessments were undertaken at the final follow-up. Then the uh, inclusion criteria are the patients with uh, diaphyseal fractures of both bones of forearm and patients above the age of 18 years. Exclusion criteria are the compound fractures and segmental fractures. And the age distribution in both the groups, uh, most of the patients fall in the 20 to 40, fall in between 20 to 40 years of age. And the left side dark blue uh, denotes the bar denotes the LCP and fixation, and the uh, right side light blue bar denotes the LCDCP. And the more of injury in most of the cases in both the groups are the road traffic accidents. And the side of injury, the, both the sides are equally involved in both the groups. And the level of fractures are mostly at the mid level in the study. And uh, type of fractures, most of them are transverse and oblique. Then uh, uh, the uh, standard principles of fixation have been followed. And in LCP fixation for axial compression, the plate was first fixed with a uh, non locking screw after reducing the fracture, followed by another conventional screw in the opposite fragment. Locking edge screws were used for the rest of the screw holes. And for the bridging technique, where there is convention only locking edge screws were used, we uniformly used bicortical locking edge screws. Then patients were followed up at 1, 2, 3, and 6 months and 1 year thereafter, with radiographs being taken at regular intervals. And results were evaluated on the basis of fracture union, range of movements, and subjective complaints, according to the Anderson et al. series grading. Anderson et al. series grading is relevant to excellent good and poor uh, results based on these three uh, anatomic fracture healing and uh, uh, range of movement and subjective complaints. And then the results are the uh, time required for LCP fixation is uh, found to be 12 minutes more than the fixation for LCDCP. And the duration of union is. Uh, uh, two weeks more in the LCP than the LCDCP. So the mean time is 18 weeks in LCP and 16 weeks in LCDCP. Uh, but the functional assessment uh, and some metal grading, uh, we found uh, all the cases in excellent and good uh, group. Then the, but, uh, there is no significant difference between the two groups. And complications like uh, superficial infection, radial nerve injury, we have seen, but uh, they are treated by um, conservative methods. And coming to the clinical photographs, this is a case fixed with LCP, preoperative x-ray both bones uh, forearm, showing an, I'm able to comment about the screws here we have used in our government institution, in spite of uh, uh, many requests and complaints, we could not get uh, appropriate size screws for about a year, so we have managed to do with this. And these are the radiological follow-up x-rays, shows good union and after implant removal. And then this is the clinical photographs with good range of movements. This is the second case, fixed with LCP, uh, showing good reduction and good fracture healing. These are the clinical photographs. And L coming to the LCDCP clinical photograph, the radiological photograph shows the both ones for am in the first. And the immediate post-op x-rays and uh, regular follow-up x-rays have seen shows good uh, uh, fracture healing. Then these are the clinical photographs. This is the second case uh, fixed with LCDCP. Then coming to the discussion, open radiation plate fixation has been the gold standard treatment of diaphyseal forearm fractures, but the most effective type of plate fixation for diaphyseal fractures of forearm has not been well defined. And lock of plates, the internal external fixators, does not rely on frictional force between the plate and bone to achieve compression and provide absolute stability. Because the local blade supplement and the plate to be preserved, thereby leading to superior bone healing and minimal complications. It has been proved to be valuable in situations like osteoporosis, comminuted fractures, complex intraarticular fractures, or fractures in close proximity to the joints. LCP fixation was found to consume more time compared to that of LCDCP, that's uh, 12 minutes more. Of course, it's not so significant. And I was treated by a union rate of 100% with one delayed union in LCP group. The main time of union uh, was uh, 18 weeks in LCP and 16 weeks in LCDCP. And uh, finally, the results are not so significant, there is no significant difference between the two groups. And the limitation of this study is small sample size and study from a single center, and significant conclusions could not be drawn. LCP plating is an, uh, I would like to conclude, like uh, locking compressive plating is an effective treatment option for fracture shaft of forearm. The present study could not prove the superiority of locking compressive plates over limited contact dynamic compressive plates. It is the proper application of the principles of plating and not the type of plate which decides the outcome. 
whether long term antisynthetic steroid is required to prove behaviors of the implant. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. What is the, uh, the selection criteria for patient when you do LCP or LCDLP? You randomly selected 20 20 patients or yeah. is there any selection no, criteria? Sir, uh, we have randomly selected cases. Sir. Usually, uh, generally speaking, for comminuted fractures and osteoporotic bones, we will be using SCPs. But here, uh, for there are studies like uh, uh, if you use SCP than NCDP, we uh, with the dynamic compression, conventional screw application. Good stability and compression at the fracture site will be there than SADCP and DCP, regular DCP. So, we have tried to show that LCP is superior to SADCP, but uh, the results show both are same. But, but when you use two conventional screws on both sides of the fracture, mm -hmm. the whole purpose of LCP is lost. So, how do you explain this? Why did you select that implant when you are using two conventional screws on both sides? Sir, but the remaining screw holes are uh, so uh, all the conventional screw on both sides. Yeah. The plate is already. Uh, uh, Getting closer to the bone, okay. you are already compressing the blood, superficial blood supply. Yeah. So, what is the whole purpose of using LCP? Uh, so, uh, to conventional screws the bone, right? Yes. Uh, conventional screws will not be completely tightening, sir. But after application of the remaining uh, locking screws, one or two, this side, then we will be tightening the uh, conventional screws further. So, a little bit compression is there, but uh, completely it's not. It, uh, it doesn't follow the dynamic compression principle. Once you put the locking screw, there will be no more compression at the practice side. Yes. But uh, while screwing it, uh, not completely, to some extent, the compression will be there. Further, we cannot achieve with LCP. Uh, have you done any cost comparison? Do you know what's the difference in cost between locking plate and FCDCP? Cost, uh, cost. cost difference. Eh? LCP is costlier than LCP. Uh, around uh, now, we are getting uh, the, with the government supply of uh, Sharma Surgical. So, we will be uh, getting NCP for about uh, uh, 6,000 and NCDCP at uh, 3,500. And that fact is important because your studies are consistent with other studies around the world and there is no real advantage of locking compression plate yeah. in routine fracture situation. Mm -hmm. you have to keep your indication still. Yeah. So, the next speaker is uh -huh. Mahesh. 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 Yeah. 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 Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Mahesh, uh, speaking of uh, outcome of uh, proximal factor in uh, twin patients of the first study. Uh, introduction. The proximal humerus fractures have been reported to account for 4 to 5 percent of all fractures. In elderly, it is usually a common with a trivial trauma and in young patients with high velocity injury. The various treatment has been uh, recommended for that like conservative, uh, care fixation, proximal humerus splitting and IML drilling and uh, primarily orthoplasty. Uh, in this uh, classification, it has been uh, classified as 2 part, 3 part and 4 part fracture with, uh, with or without uh, dislocation. There is according to me, it says that uh, displaced and unstable extra or intraarticular fractures are most commonly treated with orbital reduction and fixation using various uh, techniques. Needs two part anatomical neck fracture or three part or four part fracture as uh, with dislocation, the high risk of AVN, which has to be fixed with surgical. Coming to LCP, the basic principle is the internal external fixator with angular stability. The screw which locks in the plate gives us the fixed angular transfer and also the monocortical screws which can be applied. The filler splitting which we use is the uh, proximal humerus internal locking system is the latest generation <laughs> for the treatment of displaced proximal humerus fracture which has the convergence and the divergence slot which are with the cable slot for the locking. The current study which we uh, conducted was a prospective study of 20 cases. It was a study from October 12 to uh, October 2013, that is one year of uh, duration. The follow-up of taken was from uh, 3 months to 9 months with the average of 6 months and the male to female ratio was 18 years to 1 where uh, male patients were removed and the mean age group was 42, point, uh, 42 years. The inclusion criteria were displaced needs 2 part, 3 part and 4 part proximal humerus fracture with or without dislocation. Also the proximal humerus fracture which is extending into the shaft of the humerus. The exclusion criteria were the open fractures, pathological fractures, non of the proximal humerus and skeletally mature patients. The current study which uh, uh, we had the uh, and a filler splitting with the anterior lateral approach and the follow-up was taken at 3 weeks, 6 weeks, 3 months, 6 months and 1 year then an X-ray was taken at each visit and the patient was assessed with constant borderline scoring. In the mid -class, uh, classification, our patients uh, had 8 patients were 4 part fracture and three, uh, 6 patients were 3 part uh, fracture and other 6 patients were 2 part fractures. 
The operating method, the machine was put on a BJ position in the radio list enabled. The operation was gripped free for manipulation with the anterior lateral retrograde splitting approach. The data uh, reflected laterally and with joystick manipulation, the wire collapse was reduced. The fracture was aligned and the plate was held ribbon with a K wire temporarily and then fixed with screws. And the minimum of 1 cm of uh, adhesive was maintained from the plate to the GT to prevent impingement. An arm placed in arm boat, the patient discharged in the first post update with IV antibiotics for 24 hours and the patient was followed with a pendulum exercise starting at 3 weeks and active assisted full movements from 6 weeks. The advantage of uh, Philips plating were it can be applied for community fracture, early mobilization was possible, there was no bone to plate interface, it can also be applied to the osteoporotic bone, polyvoxyl screws and fixed angle cruset. But one disadvantage is which requires surgical expertise for the fixation. In the, the current uh, series, uh, the mills were maximum uh, patients and the middle age that 40, uh, 42 years was the average uh, thing. RTA was the most common mode of injury. In a study when it was compared with the other study, uh, when uh, the global global at all, uh, we were compared with the mean age of 44 and our, our study was comparative with that and the uh, RTA was the uh, most common uh, cause which was uh, comparable with the herb. The constant body square which was based on pain, activities of daily living, range of movements and the power. We had 9 satisfactory results, 2 excellent results and 3 good results and adequate and 4 were 3 patients with each. In the discussion, uh, with the uh, constant body square which was comparative with the uh, John Magnus which was conducted in uh, 2004, uh, we had 45% uh, of uh, satisfactory results and similar results which were obtained with uh, John Magnus. Plus plating is a versatile implant for the proximal humeral fracture which allows early mobilization technically which is a technically demanding procedure and uh, reduction will be difficult and challenging will, and we should uh, take the axillary now and also which explains the risk of avian arthritis and stiffness. We had uh, noted uh, four complications that is the stiffness for uh, avian impingement uh, and one patient had uh, reflex assembly of dystrophy with carpet and syndrome which was released. In conclusion, the fluid splitting is an IT implant in proximal humerus fracture which gives the angular stability in comminuted fracture, osteomotoric carbon in elderly patients that are suffering for early mobilization, it controls well with the proximal humerus, but the surgeons require adequate skill for the fixation, uh, poor screw uh, purchase in the osteoporosis which can be avoided by fluid splitting. Comminuted proximal humerus fracture are professionally challenging with the muscular forces, fracture anatomy and the risk of AVM. Proximal humerus fracture usually require operative intervention to ensure the correct positioning of the fracture fragment and to allow early mobilization. These were the few follow-up experiments which we had taken. Uh, this was the uh, three-part uh, fracture of the proximal humerus, which was the follow-up. And this is the patient with the uh, range of uh, motion. And this was the second patient. And also we had uh, a complication of uh, stiffness uh, in the three-part fracture dislocation where the uh, patient could move and one patient had with uh, impingement and the other patient uh, had uh, avian of the proximal lumens. The patient was advised for MRI placement and yet to follow. Questions? Yes, it's, uh, mean average was 42 years. Yes, sir. RTA, if there are four part factors, yes, there will be other associated injuries also to have been done. Yes, uh, the other associated injuries, there was not the inclusion criteria, sir. The one which had only the proximal humerus fracture, but uh, that was the inclusion criteria for our study. No, in the osteoporotic bone, you can get uh, this uh, type of fracture. But in young patients, you the other associated injury, the patient with other associated injury, they were excluded from our study. The, only, the patient which had only proximal humerus fracture, they were included in our studies. Yes. How much time you have taken for removal? Uh, once the fracture gets united. Huh? Fracture gets united. Yes, so one patient we had removed after eight months, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that plate uh, came off easily, sir. That was not a problem with that. Because we have removed one uh, plate on uh, this removal. Yeah, but uh, they, have, they have problems of cold welding, if you know. Mm. Yes, sir. So, but we are lucky for that. All working plates can get cold welding. Yeah. We, are, we are lucky for that patient that we have removed uh, with. In all of the patients, you have got good movements. So, most of uh, in that, uh, uh, two patients had excellent results. And uh, three patients had good results, and nine uh, patients had. Twenty-two patients had excellent results. Ten patients had excellent. Yes, sir. So you, you have compared your uh, results with the conservative ones or not? 
कंजर्वेटिव आंसर है are designed for the same reason you can go through standard direct operator approach you don't have to go into lateral okay. and the advantage is if you need to do revision surgery in the future yes. you can not play time me or reverse for that matter you can go through the same incision thank you that already is the only muscle which you will left in your shoulder for reverse uh, shoulder okay. arthroplasty so that is in can be lost accidental thank you sir. thank you dr mayesh now the next speaker even sir to be on the chair to speak on alignment of fracture angle at the junction of medial on the third lateral and lateral third with the modified fifth of it bandage good morning chair presenter fracture uh, teachers and my seniors myself dr devender finally a pg resident from jodhpur i am presenting a paper entitled management of fracture clavicle at the junction of medial one third and lateral two third with modified figure of eight bandage under guidance of my sir dr amsha Fracture clavicle is the most common injury that involves fracture among all ages and both sex groups. Some of the patients do not take treatment. Some of the patients take treatment from quacks. Some patients come to orthopedic surgeons. They treat usually with conservative method in the form of finger of eight, clavicle brace, sling support. Recent trend is towards operative treatment. Ten to fifteen percent of all adult fractures are clavicular fractures. The incidence is highest among young people. Fracture distribution along the bone is. Medial part is involved in 5% cases. Middle and sharp, that is sharp, is involved in 70 to 80% cases. While later part is involved in 15% of cases. As you all know, clavicle connects properly into the body. is located directly over the first rib. Articulus is formed two articulations. Middle with the membrane stem, later with the acromion process of scapula. The mode of injury, the most common mode of injury is fall directly on the involved shoulder, fall on outside hand. The pathological anatomy involved in the fracture is the middle fragment is pulled upward due to the action of stenoclavicular muscle muscle, while the lateral fragment is pulled upward due to the gravity of the fracture of upper limb. This is the classification, a classification showing the fracture fracture clavicle. There are various treatment options, uh, out of which the conservative management and operative management. In conservative, we usually use simple arm sling, fear of eight bandages. Brace with arm sling. While in operative management, we use pad with screws, intramural devices, threaded pins, while nail with interlocking screws. Plating that is operative and uh, plating has a few disadvantages. That is hypertrophic scar formation, non-union infection, prominent plate often require removal, refracture after hardware removal. The mean age of complete healing depends on the age. Patient less than 10 years or younger have mean age of complete healing 4.5 weeks, while in 10 to 20 years it is 6.7 weeks, while 20 plus has 11 weeks. This study is done in the Department of Orthopedics, Dr. S N Medical College, Bhopur, from June 2010 to May 2013. In this study, the Shah's modified figure of eight bandage is applied in cases of fracture clavicle where middle fragment is lifted upward in relation to lateral fragment. Fracture level is usually at the junction of middle one third and little two third. Total number of 40 cases are taken, out of which 28 are male and 12 are females. Average age is 30 years. It is a simple OPD procedure. Five patients require hospitalization due to any other associated injuries. The modified figure of eight bandages are applied for a period of six weeks with clean support. 
check x ray were done after applying the bandage and then after seven days the note was written if it became loose usually after three to four days bandage hangs when it becomes dirty or fall thinning in between the strap of figure of eight bandage passes over the little fragment of dressing the lifted little fragment downward and direction is achieved in cases where the little fragment is depressed in relation to middle fragment routine figure of eight bandage increases the gap between the fracture fragment in cases where the middle fragment is lifted up where the strap of sharp modified bandage passes over the middle fragment pressing it downward and aligning it with the little fragment this alignment is clinically palpated and checked now we are showing some cases in which we have applied this bandage and method of application this, this is the case number 1 35 year male showing the method of application of figure, modified figure of head bandage from front and behind sir this is a pre application and post application x ray this is case number 2 showing the method of application pre application and post application x rays this is a case number 3 pre and post application x rays case number 4 pre application and post application x ray five case number pre application post application six seven clinical photograph showing dimple of skin just after the injury sir advantage of this method this is a safe simple and cost effective method no operative hazards or complications there and it is an easily applicable method sir results are excellent in all cases union is achieved in good, good alignment in 6 to 10 weeks no complication occur cosmetically accepted acceptable position where as in usual figure of head bandage is used in such cases the bump is seen to do improper alignment and my unions thank you sir <coughs> any questions as it is applied in the fracture will uh, at the junction of medial one third and lateral two third medial fragment is lifted upward and anteriorly as we apply the note which lies on the medial fragment is uh, depresses this medial fragment downward and posteriorly so aligning it with the lateral fragment can you show the slide once more so sir sir everyone yes uh my question to you is why did you do the study are you aware of the world literature which shows that simple sitting works as good as figure of eight or any other conservative method sir in most of the patient there is a complaint of this uh, uh, malignant or cosmetic deformity sir because of improper alignment sir Are you aware of any comparative studies which use only sling versus this type of bandage? This are are invention my sir's invention sir. Okay. Sir, I am just asking, have you done any literature search to compare figure of eight versus simple sling? Is there anything in the literature? No sir, no. I am asking you a question. No sir, I am not going through it. So how how often you keep tightening it? How often you keep seeing the pain? Sir, so, uh, first of all, in, as soon as we apply, then go for check X-ray. Then every so weekly we are follow the patient for at least three weeks, sir. Yeah, because there's every chance of losing the yes, sir. reduction. Yes, sir. And uh, where where all of them on an additional sling? Yes, sir. There are additional sling arm pouch slings given to the patient, sir. Because they're not seen in the reading. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Jivan Chaha. Thank you. Come, can you repeat the next speaker? Dr. Chiran Ji, we are going to speak on modified lateral procedure for recurrent shoulder instability. Series of ten cases. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Chiran Ji, and my paper is on modified lateral procedure for recurrent shoulder dislocation. It's a series of ten cases. Michael Lattaja way back in 1954 described this procedure in which he transferred the horizontal limb of the coccygeal process with its attached conjunctival tendon to the anterior inferior glenoid defect. The main principle of this procedure is to reconstruct the glenoid arc by the coccygeal process and dynamically stabilize the joint by the conjunctival tendon and the subscapularis. The aim of our study is to know the functional outcome of Lattaja procedure and to compare our results with the previously published literature. Coming materials and methods from 2011 to 2013, all the patients presented to our department. Clinical shoulder instability or dislocation were evaluated clinically and radiologically. All patients with tight band cartilage lesion and or a hill sack lesion were included. In patients with isolated soft tissue band cartilage lesion, hyperlaxation examination 
surgical infiltration were excluded. Coming to the surgical procedure, the patient is placed in a beach position. The well versed delta vectoral approach was used. The coracoid process with its attached condom hormone is exposed. On the medial aspect, the vectoralis minor insertion is subtrapostally elevated. Laterally, the coracoid abdomen ligament is cut, and the coracoid process is also approached at its knee. The osteomized coracoid process is prepared with two drill holes placed at a distance of half inch. Lateral gill movement ligament to gill movement joint is exposed by placing an anterior incision in the sub subscapularis muscle with uh, keeping the lower one third of the subscapularis intact. And the coracoid process is placed at its anterior inferior after the rhinoid and fixed with two gamma uh, cancellous screws, thereby reconstructing the rhinoid arc. And the subscapularis is repaired. Then the post op evaluation, we have used Rome and Oxford filters to instantly the index. Coming to the results, the mean fall up period was one year and uh, no patient had recent episodes of dislocation or instability post operatively. Mean adduction achieved was 170 degrees. Mean loss of acceleration compared to the opposite limb was 10 degrees. And all follow up post uh, radiographs have shown good uh, graft position and graft union. This is the row score in which six other patients have shown excellent results. Three patients had good results and one patient had good results. And after the short instability index, uh, four patients had got uh, excellent results and uh, Five patients have got good and one patient have got fair result. This is after the comparison to previously published literature. Though the study group is small, the results we have achieved are almost similar to the previously published literature. Okay, this is the mass chart of the 10 patients that were operated. Coming to the case, this is a 25 year old male. He is an ophthalmology technician in our institute. He presented with uh, significant uh, recurrent dislocations and a significant gamoid uh, defect we see in the MR. This is the post operative radiographs. This is a post operative range of motion, full abduction, full fire reflection, and an almost complete exploitation. This is the second case. He is an epileptic, a 24 year old male. You can see a large insect lesion in the This is the post operative radiographs. This is the post operative range of motion. This is a one year follow up. This almost complete exploitation. This is the third case, a 20 year old male, he is a student, he had a high rate of uh, dissolutions, almost 30 episodes per year, there is a large anterior gamut uh, defect, so we have done a larger procedure, the post operative range of motion. Now, is there really need for the lateral procedure? As we know, the most common surgery performed for uh, recurrent point instability is an arthroscopic or open bank repair. Because the most common lesion, uh, lesion associated is a Bacard's lesion, this uh, technique yields excellent results when done for an isolated Bacard's repair lesion. But inferior results have been reported when the bone deficiency is a major comorbidity factor for the instability. Many studies have shown high recurrence rate with arthroscopic Bacard's repair, not for recurrent shoulder instability that was associated with significant bone defects. And the indications of this procedure is situations where the capsule lateral repair is insufficient to provide stability to the joint. These are Bone defects, that is glenoid defect rather than 25, insax lesion rather than 30, or an engaging insax lesion, complex capsular abdominal injuries, these are hagal lesions, and the revision surgeries for the instability. With this, I would like to conclude saying that the soft tissue bankers divide yield good results when used for capsular abdominal elevations and tears. Patients with more complex lesions need a surgical option that addresses these lesions. With good clinical and radiological evaluation, more complex lesions can be identified and successfully treated by the Lattage procedure. These are the references. These are the department, the Vijayanagar, Maharaj Institute of Medical Sciences. Thank you. Any comments, questions? You have done really well. These are very complex uh, cases. Glenoid or uh, for the matter, big research regions and your results are very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chiranji Yorado. In regard to the next speaker, Dr. Anshul Sobhati, to speak on the significance of comparing effect of weight bearing and non weight bearing merchant view on the pedal femoral indices in individuals without and with pedal femoral pain. Good morning, everyone. My topic for the day is the significance of comparing effects of weight bearing and non weight bearing merchant view on the pedal femoral indices in individuals with and without pedal femoral pain. Conflicts of interest, none. It's a well known fact that conventional knee joint radiographic evaluation is now on a weight bearing film, as seen below. So, what about a merchant's view? Is the standard supine non weight bearing merchant's view enough? 
or is there a need for a standing with bearing motions view? The motivation of this study was from the petal field evaluation of total knee arthroplasty, where there is a validation of a new weight bearing axial radiographic view, and thus led us to believe that there is a need to evaluate petal femur joint on weight bearing. That's the utilization of the axial weight bearing view. In this study, 44 knees without patellofemoral pain syndrome and 51 knees with patellofemoral pain syndrome were retrospectively evaluated with supine and standing motions view. The, effects on, uh, the effect of weight bearing on the patellofemoral joint indices and statistical evaluation and correlation factors were noted. Normal knees group included patients without patellofemoral pain and without radiographic abnormality. The pathological knee group included patients with patellofemoral pain and radiographic abnormality. The particular tilt angle ranged from 0 to 10 degrees and the congruence angle from the range of minus 12 to 0 degrees which was defined as normal. All subjects were between the age of 18 and 39 years. The group of normal knees included 22 women and 22 women with mean age of 27.8 years. The group of pathological knees included 27 men and 24 women with a mean age of 27 years. The question positions for the merchant view is as below. The left side shows you the standard uh, non-weight bearing merchant view and the right side of the diagram B shows you the standing merchant view. Radiographic definitions of the patellar indices were as follows A showing with the patellar tilt angle, B showing with the lateral patellar femoral angle, similarly C showing with the patellar lateral subluxation distance, D lateral patellar displacement, and E is the congruence angle. Various correlation parameters were measured on the long view x ray, which are the femoral offset, femoral length, thigh width, tibial and calf width, as well as the radiological Q angle and the mechanical axis. Intra observer percentage of agreement averaged on 90% with a Kappa coefficient of 0.86. The pair T test performed. Nine correlation parameters were evaluated with univariate and multivariate regression analysis, and the level of significance was set at a value of 0.05. The results showed that the knees without patellofemoral pain had a statistically significant value of patellar indices changing from a weight bearing to non weight bearing in terms of the patellar tilt angle, lateral patellofemoral angle, the subluxation distance as well as the uh, lateral patellar displacement and the congruence angle. Similarly, in knees with the patellofemoral pain syndrome, the P value is again statistically significant in the indices changing from the weight bearing to the non-weight bearing position. Uh, with a patellar tilt angle, lateral patellofemoral angle, subluxation distance, lateral patellar displacement and the congruence angle. These were then uh, under these, these results then underwent a regression analysis of univariate and multivariate comparison. Knees without patellofemoral pain showed that the the factor which was mainly involved was the radiological Q angle and in the knees with the patellofemoral pain syndrome was the calf width. To simplify, we found that the main correlation factors were radiological Q angle and calf width in normal knees and pathological knees respectively. Among the correlation factors, radiological Q angle was correlated with differences between the patellar subluxation distance on weight bearing and non weight bearing positions in normal and pathological knees. Especially the thigh width and the calf width were correlated with differences between patellofemoral indices and pathological knees. Many kinds of factors might have caused these differences, but they have not been reported yet. We speculate that there may be a causal relationship between the thigh and the calf muscle weakness and differences in their presentation in the pathologic knees. This is the case example of a 25 year old male showing you that the patellar indices clearly changes from a non weight bearing view to a weight bearing. As you can see, the decrease in the patellar tilt and the congruence angle. So, what causes this difference between supine and standing motions view? The various theories, one major one being the muscle, fa muscle factor. In closed chain contractions, the onset of EMG activity shows that there is more simultaneous quadriceps activity. In the open chain contractions, significantly de delayed onset of the vastus medullus oblicus activity. This, this imbalance causes a more lateral patellar orientation during the supine open chain kinematics. Also, the kinematics and weight bearing activities is a factor. Knee kinematics during walking are different from kinematics measured during non ambulatory activities. The center of rotation in an open chain activity is in the medial compartment, whereas during walking or in a closed chain is predominantly on the lateral compartment. Thus, to conclude, compared to the non weight bearing merchant view, the weight bearing merchant view showed significant, statistically significant difference between the patellofemoral indices in knees with and without patellofemoral pain syndrome. Furthermore, the effects of weight bearing on the tilt and lateral translation of patella was significantly increased in the pathological knees with patellofemoral pain syndrome. These results suggest that the patellofemoral indices measured during non weight bearing supine position does not sufficiently represent the patellofemoral kinematics during the normal weight bearing activities. Thus, there is a need for a uh, standard shift from a standard to a standing merchant's view. <coughs> the study has been recently been accepted as a publication in the International Journal of Clinical Radiology. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Pat. Any questions? It's an interesting topic. My question is, uh, what was the flexion angle when patient was weight bearing? 45 degrees again. Like again. I showed so you. So you made a yeah. stand of knees yes. flex 45 degrees. That's right, yes. Okay. And there's a and support at the back, also yeah. in the front, which holds. 
but in what normal activity of daily living you use that position weight bearing 45 degree so position. the whole concept is on weight we, the merchant's view is done on 45 degrees for a clear angle yes so you want to see the under surface of the patella that's yes. why the view is taken in that angle mm -hmm. So in, the, in, in no normal position of life are you at 45 degrees of flexion even in supine position. So your main aim of 45 degrees is not because you want its activity to lower degree, but that's because of the clear uh, visualization of the patellar surface, under surface. So that's just a radiological angle. But the main concept is to switch from a non-weight bearing to a weight bearing view. Just to get better idea of patellar indices, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anshul Sukti. Can you have the next speaker? Dr. Avinash Talani to speak on cubitus virus deformity in a 17 year old patient. A case report. Good morning, everyone. Today's topic is cubitus virus deformity in a 17 year old patient. A case report. Cubitus virus or gunstock deformity is the most common long term complication of childhood supracondylar fracture of humerus. It has an average incidence of 10 to 50 percent, the incidence being higher in fractures originally managed conservatively. For a long time, cubitus virus deformity has been regarded as a cosmetic deformity alone, but additional complications may occur. Cubitus virus shifts the line of pull of the triceps more medially, which may cause anterior medial displacement of the medial portion of the triceps during elbow flexion. The ulnar nerve might be pushed or pulled anterior medially, resulting in an ulnar neuropathy. Cubitus virus may also be associated with posterior instability of the shoulder, recurrent posterior dislocation of the head of the radius, the biomechanics of the elbow are thus changed. The following is a case report of a 17-year-old male patient with a cubitus virus deformity of 18 degrees because of a malunited supracondylar fracture of the humerus. He had a history of a fall at the age of 5 while playing, for which he went to a local bone setter who managed him conservatively with an above elbow stab. A row mosquitomy supported by a buttress plate was performed. Preoperative assessment, AP and natal radiographs of both the elbows were taken. The carrying angle was measured on both the sides and the angle of correction was estimated. The LCPI was calculated on the affected side as described by H.K. Wong. The range of motion of the affected elbow was noted along with complaints of cosmesis, pain and loss of motor power. Preoperative plan for osteotomy. First the carrying angle on both the sides were measured. Then the angle of correction was calculated. The mid humoral axis of the affected side was then drawn over the anterior posterior radiograph. Point O was marked where this axis cut the olecranon on fossa. Point A was then marked at the junction of the lateral condylar epiphysis with the distal humerus. Point O and point A were then joined. Then the angle of correction making OA as a base was drawn. Point B was drawn where this angle cut the distal humerus. Now O became the center of the dome and OB the radius of the dome. With this radius, a dome was drawn making point O as a center. The arc of the dome was the proposed site of osteotomy. These are the post op radiographs, AP and lateral. Results and follow-up. The range of the motion remained the same pre-op and post-op, that is 140 degrees. The carrying angle on the affected side was 18 degree varus and 10 degree valgus on the normal side. Post-op, the carrying angle on the affected side was 9 degree valgus. The LCPI was 13 on the affected side pre-op and minus 9 on the affected side post-op. No complications were reported. The Belmo criteria for the assessment of the outcome was used and the result was excellent. The clinical photos, pre-op, immediate post-op, 4 months and 10 months post-op. This is a follow-up radiograph at 4 months. This is a follow-up radiograph at 10 months. Conclusion. Cubitus virus is a common complication after supracondylar fracture of the humerus and there are controversies regarding the technique of osteotomy used for the correction of this deformity. The purpose of this case report is to show that dome osteotomy is an effective procedure for the correction of cubitus virus deformity in terms of cosmesis and functional outcome. Thank you. Any methods are used to fix it? Uh, yes, sir. So, so we have many methods of fixation of a, of a supracondylar fracture. No, no, osteotomy. Uh, yes, osteotomy could be fixed by a buttress plate, could be fixed by a K-wire, could be fixed by an external fixator, but we've used a plate in this. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Avinash. Yeah. I have the... These two can we call? 
डॉक्टर प्रतीक हेगड़े एंड डॉक्टर हिमांशु सो वी कंसिडर द सेशन ऑन ट्रॉमा क्लोज थैंक यू वन एंड ऑल thank you for your you're welcome so i'll speak about a french concept uh it's not to my subject but <laughs> uh, so it's concern uh, a specific uh, french concept uh, about uh, total hypertoplasty so the the dual mobility concept was invited in france in 1974 and uh, this concept have already proved its interest for reducing dislocation rate in first intention but also in revision for the treatment for so prosthetic instability the goal of our study was to analyze the results of a series of uh, one and red primary to the hip arthroplasty combining a synfid dual mobility cup and a coai femoral stem We conduct a retrospective series, a monocenter, continuous, and homogeneous series. There were uh, 38 females and 62 males. Two patients were lost to follow up, and 15 patients died with a prosthesis in place, and the death was not implant related. We included uh, only a primary surgery. and the most prevalent etiology was uh, osteoarthritis of the hip concerning the implants we use a synfit dual mobility cup the primary fixation uh, of this cementless dual mobility cup is uh, ensured by an equatorial press fit this acetabular cup is composed of a forged stainless steel metal back with a dual coating of alumina and hydroxyapatite we associate the coai stem this straight stem made from uh, titanium alloy is fully covered with a dual uh, uh, coating and uh, with hydroxyapatite clinical and radiological assessment were regularly conducted and a specific assessment was conducted at the last follow up for this study concerning the radiological evaluation Uh, it were performed using a specific radiographic analysis software and four parameters were analyzed horizontal cup migration vertical cup migration cup inclination and femoral head coverage by the acetabular cup in order to evaluate the overall wear of the acetabular cup the mean postalmal dobinier was 10 preoperatively and 17 uh, postoperatively Concerning the results, we have two cases of early dislocation in two neurologic patients. We have three cases of aseptic loosening, and no case of periprosthetic fracture. If we regard the radiological analysis, at the last follow-up, we have no prosthetic radiolucent line and no reactive line. On the acetabular side, we have no uh, migration. the analysis of the three zone of dili did not show any osteolysis and the mean polyethylene wear in this series was 1.24 mm there was no case of intraprosthetic dislocation we retain three case of aseptic loosening at 5 10 and 11 years for hup so the survival rate was 96.8% a 12 years follow up regarding the long term acetabular cup of integration the survival rate uh, is good and if we comparing our result with those published in the literature about the long term follow up we have uh, a good uh, results uh, and uh, um, with with this cup concerning the dislocation rate uh, in our survey it is 2% which is no significant considering the data from the literature about single mobility cup in previous series about the dual mobility cup the intraprosthetic dislocation was a major complication with a rate near than 3% 
uh, in our series, we have no such complication. So which factor contribute to this improvement? First, the polyethylene liner's design was modified several times and the manufacturing tolerances regarding the external and internal diameter were increased, which prevents any blockage of the polyethylene liner during weight bearing and reduce uh, the intraprosthetic dislocation weight. The use of the, of the femoral stem featuring a sinon neck, such coil stem, may have probably contributed to prevent the anthropocytic dislocation risk. And finally, the use of a bioactive uh, coating dual mobility cup uh, with a satisfactory secondary burning growth and low rate of accepting loosening helped us to reduce the intraprosthetic dislocation. For to conclude, the same fit last, last generation uh, achieves satisfactory long-term survival rate, taking into account our results in terms of postoperative prosthetic stability and long-term implant survival. We advocate the systematic use of dual mobility cup in patients over 60 years of age or younger patients at risk of postoperative instability. Thank you very much. There. Questions? So, uh, was this study purely experimental or you use this cup routinely for anyone who is above 60 years old? Yes. Uh, in, in, so uh, is that your standard implant for everyone yes, above 60? Yes, yes. In our institution, we implant uh, more than uh, uh, 500 uh, THA per year. It's always a dual mobility cup. And how expensive it is as compared to single? It's the same. Same cost? It's the same. Thank you, Dr. Philip. I think we should declare this session over. Yeah. So I think this session is over. Uh, I don't know what else is. Next yeah. question. Yeah, the orations in the main hall, uh, Hall A, starting at 10.15.